This video is sponsored by Tokyo Treat and Sakurako. So we're getting to see Sukuna take on Kusakabe in this chapter, and it turns out exactly how you thought it would. Not very well for Kusakabe taking on the final boss of the series, and we'll get into that, but surprisingly at the end of the chapter, Miguel shows up and I guess is going to take on Sukuna as well, and we'll get into that too, of course, we'll explain Miguel, what's going on with him, and we're going to speculate about what could be happening next, as always, but, you know, let's start from the beginning. So, we're coming off of Sukuna defeating Maki with a Black Flash. Not killing her, I'm pretty sure she's just benched for now with a few other characters, including Yuji, but they'll all be back, especially the latter. So at this point, it just leaves the strongest sorcerer available, Kusakabe, taking on the strongest sorcerer in history. Sukuna. So Kusakabe, he can only really do so much because he doesn't have an innate ability like some of the other beloved sorcerers that we know in the series. So he kind of just has to use Jujutsu Toolbox stuff. Pretty much stuff that anyone could use if you are born to be a sorcerer. Such as New Shadow Style Simple Domain, which we've seen Miwa use as well. Simple Domain is primarily used in counter to like domain expansions because it protects you from the sure hit effect of them, like the effect of the domain that like instantly hits you when you're within it. So it gives you like a fighting chance and you're not just instantly overwhelmed and dominated by the domain. However, there are multiple usages for the simple domain as well, as we're going to see from Kusakabe in this chapter. As he also points out, it's not able to neutralize the actual curse technique itself. Like we said, it only shuts down the short hit effect of a domain expansion, but within the domain of the new shadow style, he can also increase the output of his cursed energy. So he's getting somewhat of a buff there and his variation of it gives it this automated response to anything that enters the domain will be automatically attacked. But of course he needs to do it himself. So it's kind of like a manual domain expansion, I guess you could say. This is like the best Kuzukabe can essentially do at this point. And we have seen something very similar to this before from Maki's father, Ogi. He used the falling blossom emotion against her, which is also an anti-domain technique. And this isn't the only parallel that we're going to see between Ogi and Kusakabe in this chapter, which I thought was really interesting because they don't really have much in common other than just being swordsmen. But I guess this just shows that swordsmen really need to utilize these anti-domain techniques because it complements, I guess, swordsmanship very well. So Kusakabe is using this to counter Sukuna's slashes, you know, his dismantles and his cleaves, mainly the flying variation of the dismantles. So when Sukuna's firing them off and they're entering his new shadow symbol domain, he could just instantly counter them. However, Sukuna's like, all right, bet. And then he fires off another one, but this time he doesn't even move. That's how good Sukuna is. I mean, we've already known that he's good. I called him the freaking final boss because he is, but he's so good. He doesn't even need to move. He could just fire off dismantles, trying to mitigate that countermeasure of Kusakabe's simple domain. But then Sukuna decides to take it up another notch and he's just going to fire off the world cutter dismantle at Kusakabe, you know, the technique that killed Gojo. So in order to compensate for that, Kusakabe expands his simple domain range so that as soon as Sukuna moves, he'll be able to counter because Sukuna has to move to activate the world cutter dismantle. Like he needs to do hand symbols and he needs to do incantations with his mouth. And also while this sequence is happening, we're getting like this flashback of the sorcerers from Jujutsu High, like complimenting Kusakabe while they're talking about him. And one of the things they say is that he's like a master of the simple domain, like the new shadow style. And that beginners usually have to use like multiple binding vowels in order to fully utilize it. But Kusakabe has completed his simple domain without any binding vowels on top of having a really wide range to it. And Miwa says like her simple domain gets deactivated if both her feet just leave the ground. So that's just how skilled Kusakabe is. And also two things being pointed out here. Miwa, first of all, she used a binding vow against Kenjaku way back at the end of the Shibuya arc, you know, put all of her power and strength into like one sword slash against Kenjaku. And then the drawback was that she would never be able to swing a sword again. And obviously that didn't work so well against him. And it makes you wonder like, man, Kusakabe could have just did a binding vow here against Sukuna, right? 
I mean, he doesn't, but I really wanted to see if he could have just abused Binding Val in a similar way that Miwa did, because obviously Kusakabe could have pulled out something way more powerful than her. I'm not saying it could have killed Sukuna, but it could have did something. But first, let's talk about the sponsor of this video, Tokyo Treat and Sakurako. Tokyo Treat is a monthly pop Japanese snack subscription box where you'll get up to 20 of exclusive limited edition and seasonal flavored Japanese snacks, including Japanese instant ramen and drinks that are only available in Japan for a limited time. While Sakurako is a monthly Japanese artisan snack box that supports local Japanese snack makers, and each box comes with 20 traditional authentic and artisan Japanese snacks including Japanese tea and a special Japanese tableware. They also come with these great booklets that give you information on all the snacks in the box as well as Japan and its culture. It's still cherry blossom season in Japan. Did you know that the beauty of sakura can be enjoyed not only during the day but also at night? Known as Yozakura? Experience the enchanting beauty of Japan's sakura under the moonlight with Tokyo Treat and Sakurako's special Yozakura box. This month's boxes feature a beautifully designed Yozakura themed box filled with a delightful assortment of Sakura-inspired treats, inviting you to immerse yourself in the Cherry Blossom Festival. Tokyo Treats theme is Sakura Matsuri Snack Box Fest and has some great snacks like Kit Kat Strawberry, Sakura Sweet Tart, Sakura Waffle Cookie, Sakura Corinto, and Sakura Cream Cake. While Sakurako's theme is a night of Sakura and features delightful snacks such as Sakura Cream Cookies, Sakura Castella, Sakura Mochi, Sakura Cashew Nuts, Sakura Yokan, and many more. Of course, all pair perfectly with their Yozaka Sakura special tea, blueberry hibiscus tea. And this month's tableware item is a Sakura glass. So for Tokyo Treat, I tried their Sakura Corinto. These are like fried bits of dough with sugar crystals and Sakura flavor. These are by far some of my favorite snacks from Tokyo Treat. Then I tried the Koikea Nori Shio chips. They have this really unique umami seaweed flavor, which makes them such a perfect savory partner for sweet Sakura snacks. Then of course I had to try the strawberry Kit Kats. These are some of the best Kit Kit Kats I've ever tried and have a perfect blend of tart strawberry and creamy white chocolate. For Sakurako, I had to start off with their blueberry hibiscus tea, which was so floral and had this really nice sweetness of the blueberry to it. Then I tried these white chocolate strawberries. It was like the perfect balance of sweet and sour flavors with the freeze dried strawberries and their tartness in the rich white chocolate. I also tried these Sakura cashew nuts. There's such a satisfying crunch to these as well as a pleasant sweet sakura flavored coating. It has such a perfect harmony. So guys, you can get your very own sakura themed Tokyo Treat and Sakura Co boxes by going to my link in the description for yourself or a loved one because they make great gifts and make sure you use code ZONIN to receive $5 off your first box. Thanks guys. And it doesn't even have to be one single powerful strike. It could have just been any kind of utility aspect of a binding valve that he could have used for an advantage, but he didn't even do anything. I just wish we could have seen more binding valves being abused here. They're mainly kind of just used ambiguously and a lot of the time off panel. Like there's multiple binding valves going on with Sukuna that we're still not even aware of. But anyway, now that Sukuna is within Kusakabe's barrier, he starts slashing Sukuna up like uh, machine gun slashes style, like something that Luffy would almost do from One Piece. And this is cutting Sukuna. It's almost like he's getting a, a, a cleave and dismantle of his own, but it doesn't really seem to phase him all that much. He's kind of just tanking it. And while Kusakabe is just lighting him up with these slashes, his sword actually breaks in the process. So at this point, he's forced to just go hand to hand to Sukuna, and we get this pretty cool sequence of a strike exchange. But, you know, of course, he's still not enough. Sukuna is able to parry all of this and fight back accordingly. And while Kusakabe is like going ham on Sukuna, trying his hardest, he's like, Why am I trying so hard? And he's like, Oh, it's because of Yaga, you know, Principal Masamichi. And it's essentially because of what Yaga did for him. As we know, Yaga's curse technique allows him to create cursed corpses. And one of the cursed corpses that he made was of Kusakabe's sister's deceased son, his nephew. So he essentially took like aspects of his soul and put it into like a cursed corpse so that his sister would always be able to have like an aspect of her son that she could come visit from time to time because 
it's implied that she needs that to continue to live, essentially. Like, she doesn't really have a life without her son. And obviously that was like a big deal to Kusagabe, and it's something that Yaga wasn't even really supposed to do. It's kind of illegal to do that. I mean, don't forget the higher-ups went after Yaga and wound up killing him because of his curse corpse technique and what he's able to do with it. And also because of corruption too, but that's besides the point. And speaking of that, in my spoiler video, I said I wanted to go over a possible theory that could be coming out of that because I also find it interesting that this is being brought up here, other than it just directly relating to Kusakabe and Yaga. I mean, that was established back in chapter 147, but it could be Gege reminding us that like, oh, hey, cursed corpses are a thing, and that Yaga was able to take a person's soul and embed it into a cursed corpse, even after they died. So back in chapter 147, as Yaga was dying against Gakuganji, he told him how to make cursed corpses, or at least like a stable cursed corpse, like the way that Panda is. And he told them that you replicate soul information from physical information, then input that information to the cursed corpse's cores, but that isn't enough. You must put cores housing three highly compatible souls into one cursed corpse and have the souls constantly observe each other. Only that will stabilize the souls and give rise to self-awareness. Then in three months time, it will achieve self-sustaining cursed energy. And Gakuganji was like, surprised that Yaga told him this. He's like, you know, why would you tell me? And Yaga was like, it's a curse, a curse from me to you. And we know that Gakuganji, of course, is still around. We actually saw him, like, with Gojo during the time scheme. He actually helped Gojo in that big 200% hollow purple in the opening of his fight against Sukuna. So I wonder if that's what's going on with all of these dead bodies that Yui Yui has been collecting. Because, you know, as we've been talking about, we still don't know if they're fully dead or not. It's still 50-50. If, like, Gojo, Higuruma, Akotsu, pretty sure Kashimo's dead, but... Even Kusakabe at the end of this chapter, instead of them just all coming back to life through some means of reverse curse technique or binding vows or something, what if some of them are being made into curse corpses? Because, you know, you can replicate the soul information from physical information, i.e. the body. Now, the only thing that's really holding me back from that is Yaga saying that it kind of takes three months to achieve self-sustaining cursed energy, but I don't know, maybe there's some kind of workaround to that. I'm not really sure, but it seems like this has to come back to in some capacity, right? I mean, Panda is still out there somewhere, right? He still hasn't been killed by Sukuna, so he at least has something, but it would be pretty wild if Gojo or Higuruma or Okotsu or all three of their souls are put into like one cursed corpse and that kind comes back and helps everyone. I mean, that would steal Yuji's thunder if it winds up defeating Sukuna or plays a big part in that, but maybe at least for taking down the curse merger, which is uh, still a thing. And I think that will come to fruition. It would be kind of anticlimactic if it doesn't. I'm not saying it's guaranteed that somebody or all of them are coming back as cursed corpses, but I think it is an option at this point. But anyway, going back to the fight, remember when we said that Kusakabe broke his sword slashing up Sukuna? Well, he takes the broken blade and he's able to extend like cursed energy from it, which is apparently this move called Hazy Moon. And this is kind of cheating, to be honest. Like. This is really bending Gege's own rules about how sorcery works and how limited you are without having innate or inherent abilities. I'm fine with it, of course. I really wish that this series explored more of that. I, I would have liked if Cursed Energy was closer to like Nen from Hunter x Hunter because that's more of a system that can be utilized on a wide scale spread rather than you just being lucky if you're born with a crazy awesome curse technique or not because other than that you kind of just have to keep digging from the same established toolbox that everybody else has access to i mean don't get me wrong hunter hunter is similar in that aspect too like there are some people who are born with like special nen abilities but he tries to go after sukuna with his hazy moon cursed energy blade but sukuna's just like nah and he catches it in his fingers because he realizes that he was going for his damaged heart you know from maki stabbing him in the back and then he just dismantles him or cleaves him X through the chest and Kusakabe's done. Yeah, as we expected, it just happened a little longer than uh, I guess what we thought, but I don't 
know if Kusakabe's dead. I mean, I've been saying this for like the last couple months. I mean, aside from Kashimo, who has uh, waffled by a net of dismantles, I don't know if Gojo's dead. Don't know if Higuruma's fully dead. Don't know if Akotsu's dead. I just don't know. So Higuruma might be alive, especially because Yui Yui shows up just like he did with the others, uh, trying to teleport him away. Taking them where? We still don't know. Probably has something to do with Shoko, maybe. And Sukuna has been aware of what Yui Yui has been doing. He also pointed out, you know, a couple chapters back, like, oh, he took Gojo's body. Like, that's how he even knew that he did that. So he's been getting kind of annoyed by it, and he quickly appears behind Yui Yui, and he's like, yeah, this is getting annoying. Not this time, little boy. But before he's able to just nuke him with, like, a cleaver dismantle, Miguel shows up and grabs Yui Yui. And Sukuna's like, I don't know who you are. And Miguel's like, ah, you must be living on their rock then. So who is Miguel? Well, Miguel originally was drafted by Ghetto, like over a year ago uh, in story time uh, for the Night Parade of 100 Demons, you know, when Ghetto was still Ghetto and not Kenjaku. And his main purpose was to hold off Gojo because Miguel has a curse tool called the Black Rope that basically shuts down curse techniques. So that's, you know, the only way that you really could have fought against Gojo at that time, unless you were like a strong and skilled as Sukuna or you had the prison realm. And, and then after the night parade of 100 demons failed, Gojo decided to just forcefully recruit Miguel to Jujutsu High Side. Kind of just forcefully turned him babyface essentially. And Miguel eventually undertook a Kotsu and they trained in Africa at some point because Miguel comes from Kenya. Because apparently there's like a community of sorcerers in Kenya, which is interesting because you know, Gege is kind of really isolated cursed energy to Japan, and I'm sure there's a reason for that. Hopefully we'll get an explanation in a Hienera flashback, because it goes, you know, before the Hienera. It probably has something to do with Tengen, possibly. So yeah, that's who Miguel is. One of the very, very rare examples of a sorcerer born outside of Japan, especially coming from a family of them, even a community. But uh, what can Miguel do here against Sukuna. Well, we don't really know, to be honest, we don't really know too much about Miguel other than what I just told you. Uh, but going back to his curse tool, the Black Rope. So like I said, it just shuts down curse techniques, just like the Reverse Horn of Heaven that Toji had. He also used that against Gojo. However, the Black Rope doesn't really exist anymore because Miguel had to like fully use it up against Gojo in that fight. And it kind of just burned away into nothingness. And it took like Miguel's family, I guess, a long time, like generations to weave the black rope to make it like what it was. And I don't think there's another one, uh, unless he randomly does have another one and he's able to use it, that would be insane to shut down Sukuna's main two weapons or whatever other curse technique abilities he has. Also, going back to the Reverse Horn of Heaven, there is like a piece of it that is implied to be have broken off of it. So that's still out there. Maybe that's gonna come back. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe Gage doesn't care. Maybe he has it. Maybe <laughs> Miguel somehow has that broken piece of the Reverse Horn of Heaven, but we don't know what Miguel's curse technique is. I don't know if he has one or not. I don't know if it's mentioned, but he might have a curse technique or something. I don't think his curse technique is shutting down curse techniques because otherwise he wouldn't have to use the black rope, but that ability was weaved into it somehow, right? So Miguel is probably going to do something interesting here, to say the least. Will he probably wind up dying like everyone else? Yeah, I, I mean, statistically, that is likely. But uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments. What do you think Miguel is going to do here? And if you like the video, please give it a like and please subscribe if you haven't already. Have a great day. I'll see you in the next one.